This is episode 499 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I am Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I am very pleased to be joined this week by Scott Appleman. He is the CEO and founder of Rainbow Riders. If you don't know who Rainbow Riders are, are you should lose your Albuquerque credibility card because uh, Rainbow Riders? Uh, I, I don't know, Scott. Are you guys? I, I assume the biggest uh, ballooning services company uh, in New Mexico in Albuquerque. Is that accurate? Um, definitely, and in the United States too. In the United States. All right, now we're stepping up a, another <laughs> notch. So, well, welcome to Tipping Point, New Mexico, Scott. And uh, uh, anything else you want to share with? Uh, folks about who you are and your history of ballooning and, and being in this industry in New Mexico. And now you are in uh, Phoenix. So uh, talk a little bit about that. Certainly. You know, I was um, 12 years old when I moved to New Mexico from California with my mom and dad. I was actually at the first balloon fiesta over at uh, the state fair, state fair grounds uh, when I was like in seventh or eighth grade. Um, and, um, you know, ballooning just kind of got me booked then. And uh, as I was going to school there, I lived in Albuquerque for 46 years. And um, as I was going to school um, at the University of New Mexico and the Anderson School of Business, a good friend of mine had a balloon, taught me how to fly, did it recreationally for a couple of years, and then just decided to see if I could make a business out of it. And uh, now we've grown to the largest hot air balloon company in the United States with over 100 employees operating in Albuquerque, uh, Phoenix, Scottsdale, and Colorado Springs seasonally. Excellent. Well, uh, that, that does bring up a question. How old do you have to be to pilot a balloon? Are there pilot's licenses, kind of like driver's licenses? Do you have to be 18, 21, 16, heaven forbid? Um, well, believe it or not, you can have a student pilot license at 14 um, and a commercial pilot license at the age of 18. Excellent. And now, when was your first balloon fiesta? I assume you've been uh, a part of those for quite a while as well. Uh, as a pilot participant in 1983 was my first year um, as a participant at the balloon fiesta. And then I uh, I loved I loved the whole culture of ballooning and the tourism business and the city of Albuquerque. And um, after a year or two of being a pilot there, I served on the board of directors. Uh, with the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta for eight years. And I am lucky enough to be the creator and organizer of the Balloon Glow, co-created oh, Special nice. Rodeo, and Albuquerque Loft. That was 87, 89, and 91 with Albuquerque Loft. So I've enjoyed uh, being a historical part of the event. Excellent. Well, uh, as the parent of three children, I can assure you that uh, my kids enjoy a lot of the uh, festivities around Balloon Fiesta and uh, the Balloon Glow is definitely one of the top uh, things to do and see uh, at Balloon Fiesta every year. Uh, so let's talk about, you know, this is, you know, we like to talk economics, dollars and cents here on Tipping Point New Mexico. Uh, talk about ballooning and uh, Balloon Fiesta and to the extent you want to conflate those two, that's great. To the extent you want to separate those two, that's also great. Uh, talk about just the economic impact that this industry has uh, in New Mexico and especially around the city of Albuquerque, where it's kind of headquartered. Well, you know, um, obviously, Albuquerque is the capital of hot air ballooning in the world. Uh, so, you know, um, ballooning is just ingrained in the culture of Albuquerque. Um, and as far as the economic impact on a year round basis goes, you know, we have 50 or 60 employees working there year round. Um, during Balloon Fiesta, that goes up to about three or 400 uh, with all the balloons that we're out there doing. Um, and, you know, it's been, uh, it, you know, the tourism industry in New Mexico is about a $2 billion industry um, at the latest numbers that I'm aware of. And uh, I can assure you, uh, a lot of the folks are coming in town to go for a hot air balloon ride. Um, because Albuquerque is so famous for it with the Rio Grande Valley, the Sandias, and the beautiful vistas. 
yeah, no, no doubt. So it's uh, you can't necessarily parse that all out. How about Balloon Fiesta itself? What's the economic impact of that particular uh, event every year? Uh, the last report I saw, which I believe was this year, and it was a challenging year with all the weather, uh, was in excess of $200 million. I think it was $208 million on the impact on the city and the community um, and the state. And Balloon Fiesta, needless to say, is, well, it is the greatest balloon event in the world. Nonetheless, I would be a little bit less than objective saying that I think it's the greatest event for the city of Albuquerque. Oh, I, I would certainly agree with you. It's a, an incredible event and something that never gets old. And uh, the amount of people that come in for that every year is uh, is quite significant. And, uh, you know, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that you are uh, having this conversation with me from Phoenix. And uh, I, I want to kind of talk about some of the challenges your industry faces uh, whether it's here in Albuquerque or uh, just as a general rule, uh, obviously Albuquerque's evolved and grown a lot, and uh, balloon landing sites I can imagine must be one of the the challenges. But uh, it's not by own, any means the only challenge. So talk about you know just like any business, what are some of the issues that you face here in Albuquerque, especially, or uh, as a general rule across the entire uh, country or where you where you work? Well, uh, there's no doubt in all three of our markets and um, definitely in Albuquerque that the development of the cities and the communities have made it more challenging with a lot less options for landing sites. Um, that's there's there's that balance between economic development and, you know, um, historical aspects um, that will always be discussed and argued in many cases. However, um, Albuquerque has been presented with some additional challenges, to be frank with you, you know, as a result of its growth, where Balloon Fiesta Park is, the west side of Albuquerque is developing very much. Quite frankly, there's a lot of people that are coming into town that don't care for the balloons, and uh, they do do a fair amount of complaining about the balloons flying, that they say that they're noisy and that they don't like them, um, which is it's been a higher frequency than it has been over the 40 years that I've done this. Um, you know, as far as um, further development and growth in the Albuquerque area for ballooning and tourism aspects, there are some big concerns I personally have um, really to coming down to cleanliness, safety, um, probably workforce uh, solutions, um, trying to get people that want to work um, in the state of New Mexico is pretty challenging to be honest with you if um and um you know i know that covid took a hard toll on by the way that it was managed throughout the state of new mexico i will say the distinctive difference between new mexico and arizona um the way it was dealt with covid uh probably saved this company relative to us being able to go to work here um as quickly as we could uh versus new mexico yeah you were uh, limited uh, well, as all businesses were very strictly by uh, this governor and her COVID policies. Now, uh, what we know now uh, and what we could have or should have known then, uh, it was pretty obvious that uh, being outdoors uh, during COVID was uh, a great way to avoid getting sick. Uh, you know, certainly being in a balloon, you're in some degree of close proximity, but uh, you're hardly, uh, you know, a threat from the virus uh what what was the impact on the industry did you were you unable to launch uh if so for how long and what what happened well okay so uh, first of all i will say that um um having relations uh positive relations with the department of tourism and stuff like that allowed me to get hot air ballooning like in the first round of approval in the state of mexico for us to start operating we came up with what we called our COVID safe practices in order to accommodate the state of New Mexico. We put up, for lack of better words, real thick shower curtains in between the baskets so people could have a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of blocking on that type of stuff. And people wore masks and we sanitized things and everything. As I look back on it, uh, you know, I don't know if I would be, <laughs> I would say that uh, we've learned a lot since then. How's that uh, relative to COVID? But uh, we were lucky enough to do it, but we had to decrease our capacities and everything. 
But what did happen with COVID, um, and, and it's weird because I remember when COVID came out and they shut everything down and I'm walking around my house at three in the morning and I'm going, what the heck am I going to do here? Um, gee whiz, I've been doing this for how long? And all of a sudden I'm told I can't do anything. As we came out and we we kept our brand up and, you know, tried to keep our, the morale of our people up. Uh, we did get to uh, use the PPP program, uh, which absolutely saved us. And I will say it's one of the few items in the government that I feel that was incredibly effective. I know that there was some that abused the system as usually, but it worked out very well for us and has since been forgot, forgiven on our uh, PPP stuff. But when we came out, my business skyrocketed. Uh, the year after COVID, uh, my sales were up 300% um, because everybody wanted to be outdoors and everybody realized tomorrow's not promised. So that bucket list item of going for a balloon ride all of a sudden really got up there. And um, it, it, it was absolutely amazing the amount of passengers that we had and that they wanted to get out and do things. Um, now, these were all locals, you know, um, especially here in Arizona. Um, the state of New Mexico was very aggressive of not letting tourism in at the at during this period of time or actually de defer um, deterring them. Um, and, you know, there was some folks from Albuquerque that did want to uh, fly, but that base uh, just wasn't as large as like the city of Phoenix, you know, with five million people in it. No doubt. And definitely, I want to chat chat about uh, the differences between doing business in Phoenix and here in New Mexico. But uh, I will uh, let you know that, uh, oh, let's see, 16 or so years ago, uh, 16 and a half years ago, uh, I proposed to my wife in a hot air balloon. So uh, I, I don't think it was a rainbow riders balloon, but hey, uh, you know, <laughs> Maybe for the 20th or 25th, we'll, we'll see. Uh, it's my one and only uh, voyage in a hot air balloon. So uh, let's do talk about, uh, you know, Phoenix versus New Mexico uh, and Albuquerque, especially. Uh, is it just the sheer size of Arizona? Because uh, talk about the, si the amount of business that you're doing there versus here, because we, we do think of Albuquerque as kind of being this premier destination for ballooning, but uh, in talking to uh, yourself and others from the company, you, your business is uh, really uh, booming in, in Phoenix. Yeah. Um, you know, the Arizona um, tourism industry is $44 billion. So it's 11 times, uh, 11, 15 times the size of New Mexico's, you know, just as a result of, you know, um, there is there is a lot to do here and to be perfectly frank with you arizona is incredibly business friendly and um when we opened up here in arizona about 14 years ago i felt very welcomed and i had agencies as well as uh industry people that were helping you uh, pave the way um and for a successful business um do you not find that to be the case in new mexico um, unfortunately, at times, um, there are cases that are good, but there's times that it's just a little bit challenging in the state of New Mexico because um, um, I just don't find it as business friendly. And quite frankly, with the new employment laws and all the different types of things that are coming down there, um, it's more and more difficult. With the employment laws, as well as the employment pool, uh, it's more and more difficult to find people and we employ less people <clears throat> in New Mexico than we do in Arizona because of what I'll just call culture of, you know, the worker um, and quite frankly, the government authorities, uh, taxes, et cetera. Right. Does the gross receipts tax direct impact you differently than, uh, uh, than, you know, sales taxes, for example, in, in Arizona, uh, now, there's a lot of nuance to New Mexico's gross receipts tax, and that's something that we've worked on and railed against for many years. Uh, does that have a unique impact upon your business? Well, um, it's funny you bring that up because about 25 years ago in New Mexico, I was presented with a gross receipts back tax of about $125,000. Uh, and this was probably back in the early 90s. And I go, oh, my gosh, what the heck? 
um, because it was always our understanding that um, this the, any state cannot tax items that are using federal resources. We fly through the federal airways. Therefore, state gross receipts taxes don't apply to hot air balloon rides. So after four years of fighting with tax and rev and tens of thousands of dollars of attorney fees, that was all rescinded because the state, whether it's New Mexico, Arizona, or New York, cannot tax with aircraft flying through federal airways. Interesting. Now we play play penny attack taxes with obviously employees, property tax, business equipment. Um, if we're doing activities on the ground, then we pay our gross receipts tax on those items. But uh, as far as the actual flights go, since we're using federal airways, it is not applicable for state taxes. Wow, uh, I that I, I am about as knowledgeable about the GRT as anybody in the state of New Mexico. But um, that that is one that I was not familiar with before. So uh, obviously, it took you a while to figure that out in court as well. So it wasn't uh, exactly simple uh, to figure out, but uh, you're, you're highlighting something very interesting there. Uh, you, you mentioned briefly uh, the workforce issues. Uh, that's a challenge for every business, and it's something that uh, in New Mexico government makes it particularly easy to uh, sit around and not be uh, involved in productive economic behavior. Uh, is it especially hard to find good people in New Mexico to fly balloons and to do so in a responsible way? Um, yeah. Um, you know, as far as the flying park goes, finding good pilots nationwide is difficult. I'm not going to say that. And that challenge exists in New Mexico as well as it does in Arizona and stuff because we're very picky for our standards of our pilots that are doing it. What I'm having problems with is admin office people, crew chiefs, okay, uh, which is more that you know more more that type of uh, uh, appointment. And uh, you know, I would agree with you that the state of New Mexico does not incentivize people to work. In fact, in my opinion, they decentivize people to work uh, by the things that are done. Um, and you know, I was just there this weekend. I'm I'm in Albuquerque. Um, probably uh, at least once a month for, you know, a week, that type of stuff, going back and forth. And I want to make it clear that I lived there for 46 years. I was educated there. My business would not be what it is without Albuquerque and New Mexico. My family, my dad, my brother, everybody all have businesses there. The simple fact is, is that the direction it's going right now is, is scary. Um, the resources of the state of New Mexico, the beauty um, the destination itself has so much to offer. And personally, I just feel as though that people are scared that their place where they're at is going to be threatened by change. And change is can be good. Um, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's sad. Um, I'm very appreciative and um, realize you, you never forget where you come from. But the way things have evolved with the safety. I mean, I've never felt more unsafe when I'm at a hotel, um, which I have sold my residential property there. Um, but staying at hotels and and stuff like that, there I, uh, I'm, I'm very aware of my surroundings uh, going in and out. Uh, restaurants, uh, looking at all the restaurants, everybody's got a help wanted sign out there. Some of the best restaurants in the world in New Mexico that didn't recover as a result of folks that didn't want to go back to work. Um, and it's just sad, or you see a, a restaurant that is halfway filled uh, when it can be fuller filled, but they can't get people that want to work. Yeah, uh, I, I'm aware that that is a serious issue and something that uh, is one of many challenges needing to be addressed. Let's talk about safety though, real quick. Uh, uh, you know, ballooning is obviously unique and, uh, you know, you never know what, where one of those balloons is going to land. Uh, of course, and traveling into Albuquerque requires the use of trailers, and uh, you got to secure those balloons in the, uh, the back of the, the vehicles. And uh, I, I know that uh, virtually every balloon fiesta, you hear stories of some balloon getting stolen or some issue there. Uh, 
I, I can only imagine that that must be a greater problem in Albuquerque than in Phoenix. Am I right in that? Or is that something that uh, is just because I live here and I see it? Um, I mean, there's crime everywhere, without a doubt. We've gone through our fair share of catalytic converters being stolen here in Phoenix, as we have in Albuquerque. We've been lucky, knock on wood, that um, we haven't had any of our balloon equipment stolen. We've had vans stolen, fans stolen um, in Albuquerque right out of our yard. But people cutting the fences and stuff like that. And you can put all the security up with it you want. In fact, last year, it got so bad that we had to hire a security guard to stand out with our customers' cars because two or three cars were being broken into every morning while the folks were out on their balloon ride. Um, so, you know, the security thing is an issue. I know it's a challenge for the tourism industry to be attracting people to um, Albuquerque. Um, and, you know, in my opinion, um, the leadership at the state and the city level um, has some room for improvement. Um, and I guess I was just really saddened by this last year's legislative session that some real money wasn't put into the police departments and um, the resources to help secure up the state and the city and, um, you know, go from there. But uh, it's uh, it's it's definitely not a it's not it's not good for Albuquerque, in my opinion, at this point. Yeah, no doubt. Well, uh, real quick, before we uh, shift directions a little bit uh you, we mentioned development in Albuquerque. Well, Phoenix and that whole area has developed incredibly quickly. Is that uh, a challenge as, as well in, in that area of the country uh, or Colorado Springs, another fast growing city? Is, is it the same kind of issue uh, or is it different, the development challenge uh, in, in Albuquerque versus some of those other places? Um well, in Phoenix, uh, we built an office building here, which I'm in right now, uh, five years ago. And um, three weeks ago, we broke ground on a new one, uh, moving over towards Glendale, because the whole North Valley area, uh, with the Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing facility being built up there, that we've lost that flight corridor up there. So now we're moving about 15 miles to the west, and we'll be doing balloon rides out there. So development in the Phoenix area is overwhelming it's crazy um it's it and look i'm i'm a pro business and a pro uh you know uh, evolution kind of guy relative to you know our society get you know as it changes but the growth rate out here is so fast and it's it is a tad bit scary i'm not going to kid you um and you know it seems as though that a good part of california is moving over to here um into the uh, uh maricopa county area uh, I think that uh, the time during COVID and thereafter, there was a statistic that came out that said that there was 250 people per day moving from California into Arizona, and that went for over two and a half years. Um, so the development out there has here has been very, very robust. Colorado Springs, same thing. It's growing, and yeah, we are getting moved around and what I'll call pushed around, but you know, you're just kind of, you kind of work with it and work with the landowners and the authorities to make sure that everybody's on the same page and we can work together in a good positive way. Yeah, that's, it's got to be a challenging issue because of course the development that brings people to you is also development that uh, challenges the, you know, existence of your industry in a lot of ways. But uh, uh, talking about developments, especially here in uh, the Albuquerque Metro, uh, there are talks of putting a soccer stadium adjacent to Balloon Fiesta Park. Uh, I guess before we get into that specifically, can you talk about Balloon Fiesta Park as a uh, facility, the location, you know, the, the Balloon Fiesta itself has kind of migrated a little bit around the region, uh, but it's been at Balloon Fiesta Park for, I don't know, you tell me, 20 years? Is that, is that yeah, what we're talking like, about? Yeah, yeah, so, somewhere close to 20 years. And, and what a world-class facility. It's great. It's really good for the city, the multi-use for, you know, all the soccer stuff. you got the golf down there. You've got the event center, um, the Sid Cutter Pavilion. You've got, uh, you know, for, for like Fourth of July and fiestas and events and stuff. It's an amazing facility, and it's done very well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not privy to all the details of the new stadium, but what I've heard 
um, is would be my largest concern would be that of the consumption of parking spots, uh, which I've been told is like 800 to 1,000 of the parking spots uh, on the east side of the field. So down below Presbyterian Hospital, between Presbyterian Hospital admin building going to the west, that east parking lot would be, uh, is the location that I've been told. And, um, you know, parking is always an issue at Balloon Fiesta. And uh, parking ride is always a challenge, no matter what, um, at any event. But, um, you know, I think that it would be great for uh, the United to have their own facility or to continue using the baseball stadium. But, um, you know, that location, I guess, has to be determined. So the main issue you see is uh, potentially with parking and the limitation uh, or the reduction in parking. Yeah, I mean, the other item is, is the simple fact is, is that this is the world's largest event. It is without a doubt the most iconic event for the city of Albuquerque and the state of New Mexico. It is what we are known for good. Uh, and it's already jammed up all the time. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I don't know all the details, but I'll say that there needs to be a lot of thought going into this. You know, I've heard numbers of $80 million uh, to build the facility and the city has six or eight million and they're going to raise the rest privately. Um, that's that's a pretty big gap right now, I would imagine. And I'm sure it's very preliminary, but um, I would say that as a city as a whole, I was I was once told by the manager of General Mills Plant um, that uh, when I was starting to enjoy a little bit of success, he reminded me never forget where you come from. And I would encourage those in the conversations to remember where Albuquerque really was put on the map for for good. And I believe that the balloon fiesta is a significant aspect of that. And I would proceed with eyes wide open um, on uh, modifying the existing park, which is already at full capacity during Fiesta. Yeah, uh, certainly uh, the Balloon Fiesta is right up there with Bugs Bunny and Breaking Bad. And uh, yeah. exactly. sl slightly <laughs> facetiously, but uh, in terms of putting New Mexico and Albuquerque on the map, but, uh, you know, so obviously have spent some time over at Balloon Fiesta Park and I, uh, look at that as a facility that has room for improvement as it currently stands. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer that before you go uh, chasing the uh, proverbial waterfalls, uh, you try to keep uh, the businesses that you have happy in your city and keep those uh, events successful. And there's two things that I look at Bloom Fiesta Park and say, why don't they do these, these things? One is the presence of high tension wires anywhere near the facility, specifically slightly to the east of the field. Uh, I, I just find to be inexcusable uh, that, that something hasn't been done to bury those, to make them not a threat at all to the balloons. I realize that that may not be the direction the balloons go on a regular basis, but anyway, I, I want your thoughts on that. And secondly, you know, if you go to a launch, uh, the morning event, you're walking in the dark. Uh, Alameda is a very busy road. A lot of the parking involves crossing Alameda. Why don't they have pedestrian bridges over Alameda uh, in order to allow people to cross without having uh, the potential for uh, crashes and whatnot. And the same thing in the evening, you have balloon glows and those end by definition well after dark. Uh, another opportunity, I think, to do something simple to really assist in public safety and traffic flow through the area. Uh, so would love your thoughts on both the high tension wires and, you know, something basic like a pedestrian bridge over Alameda. You know, first of all, on the big power lines, or we call them hummers, um, as balloon ride, as balloon pilots, they're very intimidating, and you know, I'm I'm uber aware of them. During balloon fiesta, Rainbow Riders manages about ten percent of the balloons, about fifty per fifty to fifty five balloons, with all of our ride balloons and our corporate clients there. And we are preaching and our level of awareness of all wires, not just those, 
is you know paramount for us to make sure that we're operating as safely as possible. Those big wires um, onto the east side of um, uh, of the park. I've never really heard of anybody being able to talk about and saying that they could bury those and move them. So I don't know that much about them. Would I feel more comfortable? Oh my gosh, yes, without a doubt, as would a million other pilots. Um, I mean, but if the ones that get you is like the wires that are coming across, like when you're flying down to the south, you know, as you get towards that Vista Del Norte area, you know, Vista Del Norte is a new area which has no power lines, which is great. Uh, Marty Chavez ended up buying that land where the Walmart was going to go, and I was part of that fight. And Parks and Rec have done their development to it, but they've put a bunch of obstacles up in there too. And quite frankly, I don't know if that really turned out the way it was supposed to, because there's always so many rules or things like that going on with that. Um, the power lines like going into, you know, the Renaissance area and going further south, they are just, it, it is what it, what it is in the city of Albuquerque. And, you know, it is a challenge to the sustainability of Balloon Fiesta in the future going down there um, from that park. But, um, you know, I would anticipate, you know, folks still coming and doing it. But when you fly in Albuquerque, it's not the easiest city in the world to fly in. And a lot of the folks that are coming here um, are um, coming from rural areas, you know, over farmlands and stuff like that. So um, I would say that this is not the most inviting area, but people still want to come here because it is the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta. Is there improvements that could be done? Yeah. How does that get prioritized? You know, I'm, I'm not part of that process. It seems like um, uh, I would love to be. Um, at one point, I was on the mayor's council to, do, to determine launch sites and stuff like that, but the group never met um, that I was aware of, and I was never given um, the opportunity to speak up there. Um, as far as like other infrastructure, pedestrian bridges and uh, stuff, I, mean, I was thrilled to death that they could finally get an on-ramp coming off of uh, Balloon Fiesta Parkway and get on I-25 to empty the traffic out, uh, you know, in the evening events or the morning events to speed that up. Uh, so there, there was a start there. But, you know, this kind of goes back to, in my opinion, is the potential fear of change um, and development that maybe some in the community don't want to see because they don't want to see Albuquerque become a big city like that or items like that. So just, a, it, it's too bad. It's too bad. There's a lot more that could be done. Yeah. And, you know, my organization is, you know, obviously a big supporter of developing our city and uh, developing the state of New Mexico economically. So I understand and recognize that there's a balance there. Uh, and, and, you know, the the types of things that we're talking about, and I don't know the uh, amount of money it would cost and who would be responsible for the power lines, but uh, certainly that event pours a lot of money and brings a lot of people here to New Mexico and uh, some certain amount of people do fall in love with Albuquerque and really uh, want to come back year after year. And uh, they, they spend a lot of money here. And uh, it's something that uh, I think too many politicians are always looking out for the next big thing and not considering the, the things that we already have and how we can make those even better. And uh, that goes for a lot of different uh, issues. Uh, before we let you go, one last issue uh, I want to bring up is the FAA uh, kind of policy that was going to negatively impact ballooning because there was going to have to be these transponders on balloons and that got at least delayed what what's the deal with that and is this something that uh, the FAA is going to uh, kill the ballooning industry here in Albuquerque and possibly across the country uh, if they eventually go along with this or, or implement this regulation and talk a little more scientifically about what that regulation means because I'm not uh, really super knowledgeable about it. No problem, Paul. So back in um, December of 2020, um, the FAA imposed a rule saying that any aircraft operating inside of Class C or Class Charlie airspace, 
which is like what this Sunport is, has to have what's called ADSB out on it. And that sends out a beacon that says, hey, this is my aircraft, whether it's a balloon or a Cessna or a Southwest jet. Um, and that's and the purpose and intent of that is all for safety. Well, ballooning and the FAA, like ballooning is kind of like the redheaded stepchild. It's yeah, part of aviation, but it, the rules really don't apply too much to uh, the, the rules. Ballooning aren't isn't taken that much into consideration when rules are put there. It becomes an afterthought. In this particular case, this rule was not being enforced all the way until um, uh, September of 21 which all of a sudden it became selectively enforced by the local FAA office in Albuquerque um, uh, just before Balloon Fiesta um, in 21. Now, the Balloon Fiesta wouldn't have been affected by it because they have what's called a waiver, which allows them to waive certain rules and the FAA and them work it out. So Balloon Fiesta was really never threatened on that. But this did um, absolutely shut us down uh, for our balloon rides uh, because we couldn't go into the Class C airspace. So let's say that we're flying down there by Hotwood Mall and going on down. We get into the Class C airspace about Montano um, at about you know 2,000 feet above the ground. Well, the rule itself says that the ADSB has to be permanently mounted inside the aircraft. Well, there's nothing permanent in a hot air balloon. They all break down. And so basically they had a rule that applied that didn't give technical specs to conform to that item. All right, so that was the whole problem. So I sat around and tried to work around quietly with people from uh, about November through February. And I just got fed up with not getting any response um, to anybody. And in February, um, and when I said nobody, um, I'm talking about government authorities in the state of New Mexico um, and the city of Albuquerque. And then I did a press conference and then the thing caught fire. Um, I will say uh, without a doubt that uh, Governor Grisham, uh, Lujan Grisham, the Department of Tourism, our state senators, uh, our uh, Congress people and U.S. Uh, senators all jumped on the uh, bandwagon real quick. And in 24 days, we got a um, what was what was a one year extension of called a letter letter of authorization, which allowed us to fly in the Class C airspace while a safety study was being done to make sure that the FAA was to make sure that they they could do this. So we got that done, and then um, in the middle of 22, I spent three days on the phone with 35 uh, other FAA officials from across the country, as well as three other Albuquerque balloonists um, that are considered you know, experts in the industry. And we did what's called a safety risk management. And at first, I'm sitting here going, oh, my God, there's one of these typical government things. But I got to tell you, man, I was really impressed with how it, all, how it was all handled, and it made a lot of sense facilitated conversation. The long and the short of it is three weeks ago, um, we, we were under NDA and we weren't allowed to say anything, but it was determined that uh, the Class C airspace rule with hot air balloons was not necessarily needed at this time. It will be used to uh, extract data to see if there is any safety issues with balloons in Class C airspace, whether it's Albuquerque or Kansas City or Plano, Texas, um, so all uh, or Colorado Springs. Um, so really, the problem started um, with enforcement out of the Albuquerque FISTO office, um, and then it got up to a national level. Um, and 24 days after. Um, we called that press conference. We had the extension to operate. And then a year later, um, it's been deemed that whether or not that rule is necessary or not, they're not ready to enforce it. And we're going to gather data and go from there. So I presume the hope is that they just uh, let the whole thing drop and uh, uh, never actually move forward with this particular regulation. Yeah, well, the simple fact is there's never been a near mid-air collision with a hot air balloon and a fixed wing aircraft. And that's really what the rule was intended to avoid. Very good. Well, uh, Scott, 
Appleman with uh, Rainbow Riders. Any uh, last thoughts, anything you want to share uh, before we let you go? You know, um, I would like to say, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak about these items. Um, I don't want to seem like I'm a downer on Albuquerque in any way, shape, or form, but there's just some things that would be great to wake up to at this point and try to recover. Uh, Albuquerque has so much to offer in the state of New Mexico, and we shouldn't get caught up in the politics and the junk. And um, what we need to do is remember to take care of the people as well as the community itself first. And uh, we want to be part of that as we go forward. And we thank the state and the city for all their support and our growth over the last 40 years. Perfect. Well, thank you, Scott, and uh, appreciate the uh, the time. And next time uh, my wife and I do a hot, hot air balloon trip or celebrate an anniversary, we'll uh, definitely check out Rainbow Riders. So uh, thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. Subscribe to this show at Apple Stitcher or tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.